Information presented in the following program is for entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as a statement of fact. Arg, shiver me timbers, matey, and welcome to another Tales from South Florida. I'm your host, Peg Leg Monty, and today we're going to be talking about an amusement park that once was the fourth largest in all of the United States. Arg, so climb on board. And don't make me make you walk the plank. Hoist the mizzen mast. This is the tale of Pirate's World. Arrgh. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the tale of Pirate's World. Now, if you lived in South Florida in the 1960s and early 70s, the words Pirate's World might have a couple of different meanings for you. Certainly, it is well known for being a place to see, well, groundbreaking concerts. Let's call them that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the show. But first and foremost, it was the grand design of a couple of men who wanted to bring a nice, clean amusement park to South Florida. Now, keep in mind, Disney had already announced they were going to build something up in the Orlando area, but no one quite knew what it was. Walt Disney himself had gone on television and talked about something called Epcot, which was going to be a city. And there was speculation that there would be a Disneyland type of amusement park built. But there was a gentleman named C.T. Robertson, lived in Fort Lauderdale. He was a developer, a financier, and he had an idea to purchase land to build a nice amusement park. Not the regular carnival that came and set up in a field somewhere or next to a church, but something that was stable, that was year-round, that families could come and go to. It was inexpensive and offered unique rides. To that end, Mr. Robertson purchased land off of Sheridan Street in Dania Beach and started the idea of a park. He didn't know quite what it would be, quite what it would look like. He didn't even know the theme he wanted. So he hired a gentleman named Bob Minnick. Now, Bob Minnick had worked for Disneyland. He'd also been a developer on a couple of projects, helped design Six Flags Over Texas and the Texas Pavilion at the World's Fair. Most importantly, he was entrenched in the customer service attitudes and trainings of the Disney Corporation at the time. He knew how to get people to do it the Disney way. And initially, this is why the park was such a great success. So now we have Mr. Robertson, we've got Bob Minnick, and then they bring in Paul Gross, who was a, a park designer. Now, after the initial talks, Mr. Gross would eventually pull out of the project itself, leaving Minnick himself to come and do the design. His idea was a park built around the idea of the pirates. And that's what they started doing. So he built a park that a lot of water-themed rides, some carnival-type rides. I remember there was like some, you know, the kind of Dumbo ride that Disney has. Well, it was the same thing, but it was rocket ships. You see it at every carnival you ever go to. You know, it goes up and down, goes into a circle. Kind of a kiddie ride, if you will. So they started designing this park with the idea that it would have shows, it would have rides, obviously, it would have good food, clean-cut American college kids doing things the Disney way in terms of customer service would be brought in. And that's how initially everything went. Now, in looking back at Pirate's World, they divided it up using what he learned from Walt Disney. So if, you know, if you've ever been to Disney World, you've ever been to Disneyland, you know that everything is divided up into segments. So you have Tomorrowland, you have Fantasyland. Minnick brought the same idea to Pirate's World. He would divide it up into legendary pirate lands. So you had the Spanish Main, New Orleans Harbor, Port Royal, the China Seas, and the Barbary Coast. And then they would put in the rides to kind of fit and make sure that they had costumed characters walking about that also were authentic to that place in the world in that time. Really nice. The funny thing was that when all of this was going on, everyone in Dania Beach and in South Florida generally hated the idea. Again, we have to go back to the time. Carnivals had a bad reputation when they came to town. The, the people that worked them were considered to be of ill repute, shall we say. I don't know if they were or not. That's just what they had. Uh, there was kind of a, you know, the games were rigged. Things just weren't great. People would go. They were very successful. But you didn't want one set up in your neighborhood all year round. And that certainly, you know, in an area where they were planning to build homes and houses and, and condominiums. And they had this 
kind of an idea of everything, setting up an amusement park just seemed bizarre. No one wanted Coney Island across the street from where they lived. Even though it was way out east, close to the beach, during that time, there really was not a lot of development out there, so I'm not quite sure what they were so worried about. But there was a lot of opposition. They tried to stop this from being built many times, according to the research that I've done. Despite all the opposition, Pirates World opened in 1967. They had brought in the steeplechase ride from Coney Island that was built in like the 1890s. There was a log flume from the New York World's Fair that was brought in. He bought a, a pirate replica ship that sailed in the, the moat around so you could ride that and you would be fired on from the land. Cannons would explode long before the Pirates of the Caribbean ride took place up in Disney. From a personal perspective, I can certainly remember going to Pirates World as a kid. Loved, I think it was called the, the Wild Mouse Ride. It was a roller coaster, but it was a little tiny car. And you always felt like you were going to go over the edge. If I remember correctly, there was some kind of urban legend that one car did. It got stuck by the back wheels. People had to be rescued. I don't know if that ever really happened or not, though. Like I say, urban legend. Another urban legend that I believe was never substantiated, but man, it's all you ever heard about when you talk about going to Pirates World, was that some kid had been on the steeplechase ride, had been bitten by a rattlesnake and died. I don't know. Again, I never heard anyone who was actually there. It was always just the story that was told. I never saw any snakes when I was at Pirates World. We just had a lot of fun. There was a bridge that swayed. There was a house that leaned at like a 45 degree angle, I think it was, or 90 degree angle. So you could lean back without falling. You had to walk through that. There was just a lot of rides. It was a safe environment. Your parents would drop you off for the day. They'd come pick you up around four o'clock and they really didn't worry about you. <laughs> I don't think that would fly today, but uh, it was, it was really just a lot of, a lot of fun uh, that I remember. I think it was something like $2 and 50 cents to get into the park and they did something there that was unique. So remembering when Disney World opened in Orlando, and I assume this is the way Disneyland was at the time, you bought a book of tickets. And in that book of tickets, depending on how much you spent, was what rides you could ride. So they had like D tickets or E tickets for the top rides, but you didn't get to ride everything in the park. What Minnick decided to do was one admission price and you ride everything. Unheard of at the time. Revolutionary. So for $2.50, you got to go in and ride whatever ride you wanted as often as you wanted to ride it. Pretty inventive, and it worked. Another thing I remember about Pirate's World is they had this arcade. I think that might have been where their food was served to or something, but there's some pinball machines. And there was a, uh, a photo booth. Now, not the kind where you could get your picture taken, but if you deposited, I don't remember if it was a penny or a nickel or a dime, you could get a picture of a star or starlet. And we all wanted the picture, all the guys anyway, all the boys. There was a picture of Raquel Welch somewhere there. Now think about it. 1967, the late 60s, Raquel Welch was most known for a film called One Million Years B.C. I think that's what it was called. In which on the poster for it, there she was in a very skimpy for its time kind of furry bikini. Uh, if you will, holding a spear and looking fierce, and she was going to go off and, and, and fight dinosaurs. Well, it was just a headshot. Whatever this photo was that came out was the headshot of these people. So, you know, I think there was like a tab hunter. Um, you know, there were, there were people like that. We all just wanted Raquel Welch. And I can't tell you how often my brother and I, when we were there, how much money we dropped into that thing trying to get Raquel Welch. I never did. I continually got the picture of someone named Gogi Grant. To this day, I don't know who Gogi Grant is, but she kind of looked like an older cousin or even my mom. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a Bridget Bardot in there too we were trying to get. I don't believe that we ever did. I'd love to hear from you. If you any of you remember that photo booth though in Pirates World where you could get those pictures. Yeah, Pirates World was, it was a great deal of fun and it was close to the beach. They had a... Uh, uh, a ride where you could you would go up to the top. Uh, I can't remember the name. Of it. it was called Pirate's Perch, I think, something like that. And from it, you could see the beach water, the ocean, because we were, it was so close to that. You know, you just kind of get a bird's eye view of everything. So a great deal of fun, but it wasn't to last, unfortunately. There were bad times that coming. Minnick eventually left the project, and someone else took over. With the advent of Disney World opening and everyone taking the time and money to go up to Orlando to go to the new park, attendance started falling. 
So they had to come up with a new idea, and they did. We're going to talk about that right after this message. Cirque du Soleil Echo, under the big top, at Gulfstream Park from February 22nd to April 21st, 2024. Cirque du Soleil Echo is a spectacular performance combining poetry, stagecraft, daring acrobatics, and technology, exploring the delicate balance between people, animals, and the world we all share. Tales from South Florida listeners also have access to special discounted single tickets and group tickets. To learn more, join our Facebook page, Tales from South Florida, or we will be giving away a pair of tickets. All you need to do to be entered is to write talesfromsouthflorida at gmail.com and say, I want to go to the Cirque. Cirque du Soleil Echo, under the big top, Gulfstream Park, February 22nd to April 21st. Be there. My friends, I want you to be part of the fun and part of the show. Share your South Florida memories with me, Bill Monty, by writing me at talesfromsouthflorida at gmail.com or give me a call. At 754-800-3170, leave me a voicemail. I'll get back in touch with you. And remember, join our Facebook group. We're having a lot of great times on there. And that's where you can find out more information about how to get discounted tickets to Cirque du Soleil Echo. Now back to the show. So while Pirates World was known for the amusement park, for the rides, for the fun... As attendance started to decline, the owners decided they needed something else to bring the crowds in. In 1969, concerts had started at a small amphitheater. (laughs) That's being very generous with that term. It was a rickety stage with a covering that really didn't keep out the elements too much, but it didn't seem to bother the people who went to the concerts. You know, I never went to one. I was too young for concerts at that time. But they were legendary. People still talk about them on Facebook groups and and everything. You know, some of the bands that played at Pirates World were Jethro Tull, Alice Cooper, Three Dog Night, Led Zeppelin played there. Uh, Yes, uh, David Bowie. Johnny Winter recorded his live album in 1970 at Pirates World. Uh, Steely Dan played there. So there was a lot going on, and that just increased the ill feelings towards the park from Dania Beach City Commissioners, from the Broward County Sheriff at the time. Everyone just wanted this place shut down because, frankly, it was loud rock and roll, and there was allegedly a lot of drug use, overdoses, and things like that. It just became nonstop at that point, the legal challenges to them staying open. At one point, the owner decided that, you know what, he'd go ahead and shut everything down and open somewhere else if they would uh, agree to some stipulations that he had. And allegedly that didn't work out because the city just knew it could shut him down anyway. When they found that the stage was not built to uh, legal specifications, That ended the concerts, and for the most part, that ended Pirate's World. On a strange little side note, if you have been here a long time, you remember in the 60s and early 70s, there was a station, I don't remember the number, I want to say it was Channel 63, maybe 61, something like that. It's called WKID, and it ran out of a building in Pirate's World. And they did like kids programming, and there was someone there who was making movies, and he made movies of Jack and the Beanstalk, Thumbelina, uh, to say they were low budget, would be generous by far one of the most bizarre films maybe ever made was santa claus and the easter bunny which primarily consists of a man in a santa claus suit sitting in a a, i can't remember now if it's an old car or a sleigh he's stuck and for some reason can't even get out of the sleigh so he just sits there in his santa claus suit on the sand and someone in a really bad easter bunny costume shows up eventually with a bunch of kids to rescue him and take him to Pirate's World. You can find this on YouTube. So, and I suggest (laughs) you might want to go look at it. But Pirate's World, again, one of those places that has a special place in the hearts of South Floridians. It really was, especially in the beginning, it was really a great place to go. And there's never been a place like that in South Florida since that had the kind of rides, that had an amusement park, that had a theme. You know, Six Flags Atlantis was at the corner of Sterling Road and I-95 in Hollywood, I believe. And it was a water park, but it was themed. But I don't recall rides there. I only went once or twice. When you have glasses, water parks are not your friends. 
But Pirates World eventually did shut down in the early 70s, and it is now shopping centers and condominiums. That entire area right there where it was is completely built up all the way to the Intercoastal Waterway. But for those of us who experienced it, it was really great. Thank you for joining us for the tale of Pirate's World. And I hope you'll continue to join us as we explore more tales from South Florida. Remember, be kind. <laughs>